Welcome, I'm Daughter of Darkness. Some people live in a haunted home once in their life, then they move and they never have to deal with the paranormal again. Yet others seem to attract spirits no matter where they go. They can move as many times as they like, and each time, ghosts await them. That's the story I'll be presenting here tonight. Be sure to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central for new content. And if you want to hear more stories like this, click on the screen at the end of the video or in the link in the pinned comment below. The great gods of YouTube are very pleased when people watch more than one video. And we want to keep them happy, don't we? That way, they'll continue to allow us to keep meeting like this every week. But for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way. And let's get scared. Together, 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 together. Eight years ago, when my wife was pregnant, we needed somewhere to bring up our first child. We chose a small town in northern England because the rent there was affordable. When we first moved in, everything was fine. We were very excited about starting our new family, and we happily went about decorating our new home. You could only access the upper level of the home by using a staircase that was located in the kitchen. Also in the kitchen was a doorway to the backyard, and it had a frosted glass window. Within a few weeks of moving there, I developed a very weird feeling, like someone was watching me through that window. It wasn't overpowering, but it did get to the point where I would actively avoid looking at that window, because part of me worried that I might actually see something looking back at me. I've always been deeply skeptical about anything paranormal, so I always tried to ignore the feeling or just laugh it off. But the feeling kept getting stronger. It got to the point that if I was ever alone in the house, I would choose to sleep on the couch because I didn't want to walk through that kitchen and up the stairs to the bedroom. Whatever was in the house, the feeling was definitely the strongest in the kitchen and on the stairs. The only way I can really describe it is that it felt predatory. There was this constant nagging feeling that something was either watching you or standing right over your shoulder about to rush you, even though there was nothing there. Things seriously began to escalate on one particular evening. We were watching the Darren Brown TV show, and he was trying to disprove all things paranormal. At one point in the show, he challenged the viewing audience to play Ouija board along with him. The premise was that he would both ask and guide the responses, and tell you what the results would be, thereby proving that it was nothing more than a parlor trick. My skeptical nature, along with my wife's belief in the paranormal, meant I was really keen to play along, just to prove to her how silly her beliefs were. So we put together a makeshift Ouija board and followed all of the instructions, but we didn't get the results that the show said we would. We got something far more sinister. When we asked the name of our spirit, instead of the scripted reply that we were supposed to get, we got the name Ernest. By this point, I was laughing, thinking that my wife was pranking me. But my wife wasn't laughing. She said we should stop. Still thinking it was her doing, I kept going. I asked, Do you like living here with us, Ernest? It moved to no. Why not, Ernest? Don't you like me? It spelled out the word rogue. Now it's worth a mention that I was confused by that. My only experience with the word rogue was in a video game. I continued, Okay, what do you think of my wife? It spelled out the word whore. By this time my wife was getting more and more upset and she was really quite distressed. We followed the rules and said goodbye. And then the glass we were using as the planchette slid over to goodbye, all on its own. Since my wife was so freaked out, I collected the scraps of paper that we used to make the Ouija board and took them into the backyard to burn them, partly for her peace of mind and partly for my own. That night, 
30 minutes or so after we went to bed, we heard a loud bang downstairs. I went to check it out, thinking that something may have fallen over, but everything was still in place. Since we lived in a terraced home, I told myself it was probably just the neighbors banging their cupboard door, so I went back to bed. The next night, again, within 30 minutes of going to bed, we heard the exact same bang from downstairs. This started happening every single night. No matter what time we went to bed, whether it was 9 p.m. or 1 a.m., within half an hour, we'd hear a bang. Always at least once, sometimes twice. We tried to replicate the sound, and after trying everything, we discovered that it was a heavy cupboard door in the corner of the kitchen. When slammed shut, it made that exact same sound. I wanted to find out what was causing the door to bang shut. We'd never had any signs of pests or vermin, and the cupboard was fixed to the wall about six feet off the floor. I couldn't imagine what was making that door slam shut. So I asked my wife to let me set up a camera in the kitchen to record whatever happened in the night when we were sleeping. But she wouldn't let me do it. She either didn't want to know what it was, or she didn't want to antagonize it. Things really began going downhill from there. We would find ourselves arguing over the smallest thing, having full-blown shouting matches for hours over nothing. I'm normally a very laid-back person, but I found myself constantly on edge, anxious and angry. This didn't happen overnight, though. It was something that built up very slowly with both of us. We didn't even realize it was happening until much later. So this was not a case of waking up a different person from one moment to the next, but a very slow, gradual change over time. I began suffering from nightmares on a regular basis. I would have very vivid dreams of family members dying in horrific ways, like being burned alive. I'd wake up screaming, and my wife would have to reassure me that it wasn't real. Also disturbing, she'd wake up in the middle of the night and find me lying there, eyes wide open, yet sound asleep. She'd gently tell me to close my eyes, and I would, but I'd have no memory of it the next day. I've never done that before nor since living in that place. The arguments between my wife and I got worse, and the regular banging noises at night continued. There was also an overwhelming sense that something was following me. That feeling was strongest in the stairwell. Despite my best efforts to convince myself that I was being ridiculous and trying to force myself to walk slowly up the stairs, I found myself clearing that flight of stairs three steps at a time, terrified. My wife told me she felt it too. There was a brief lull in the activity for about a month or so leading up to the birth of our child. It was around Christmas. The arguing stopped, and we seemed to be getting back to normal for a while. I thought we'd turned a corner. The nightly banging persisted but we had gotten so used to it that we would just look at each other and roll our eyes. Then our son was born, and everything was okay for the first week or so, but the atmosphere soon began to change. The unexplained anger and anxiousness began to creep back in, and we started to fight again. Things were made even worse because our baby would cry constantly when he was in the house. He'd only sleep for 20 minutes at a time, and when he was awake, we'd spend all of our time trying to soothe him, but nothing worked. He cried so much that we took him back and forth to doctors many times, but by the time we got away from the house and to the doctor's office, he was either sleeping or gurgling happily. The doctors would look at us like we were crazy, and I also thought we might be cracking up as well, because once we got him back home, he'd start crying again. Things came to a head one night when I was in bed. I saw a shadow person in the corner of the room by the window, and it began slowly moving across the room. At first I thought it was a trick of car headlights on the curtains, but the shadow wasn't moving right. The room was dark, but this thing was darker than the room, and it seemed to have smoke coming off of it. 
It inched its way across the standing wardrobe, and then it went around the corner and continued along the wall. At that point, I knew it wasn't a shadow. A shadow would have jumped from the wardrobe to the wall, not creep around the corner. I watched as it went out the door and onto the stairs. If this were to happen now, I'd have noped it straight out of that room. But at the time, I remember being oddly mesmerized by it. I only started to feel fear after it left the room, and I had time to think about it. I decided not to tell my wife about it. We already had enough to deal with. Telling her that I just saw a manifestation could very well have pushed her right over the edge. It was winter at that point, and the house was always cold. No matter how hard we tried, we couldn't get that place to maintain a constant room temperature. One room would be red hot, and the one next to it, freezing cold, despite the heat being set to the same temperature throughout the house. And there was no rhyme or reason to it either. Rooms that experienced hot or cold varied from hour to hour. The temperature would spike in one room, only to plummet to an unnatural cold temperature within the space of 30 minutes. We had to constantly move the baby from room to room to find a comfortable place for him. Unfortunately, I found that the one place in the house with a constant temperature was the staircase landing. So I'd find myself having to sit there, fighting my fear and desire to run away because it was the one place where our child could be comfortable. It was around this time I had a dream that I still remember very clearly. In the dream I was talking to a woman, telling her how dark and cold the house was. She asked me if I knew what that meant. Then she told me that life needs light to grow, and the only thing that thrives in the darkness is death. I woke up with those words still on my mind. Now, often when you hear stories about people staying in a haunted house, they tell you they're fighting for their house and what's theirs. But this wasn't our house. We were renting, and all the problems and the weirdness got to be too much. We found a house a few miles away and gave our notice. The night before we moved, in the early morning hours, we heard a piercing noise. It was the carbon monoxide alarm going off. We opened all the doors and windows and went outside. My wife and son went to my parents while I waited for the man from the gas company. When he arrived, he found that the problem was the gas fireplace leaking carbon monoxide. Without that alarm, we'd have all been dead. The fact that it happened the night before we were due to leave made me think that something either didn't want us to go or was taking a parting shot. I'd like to tell you that we moved and everything was better overnight, but it wasn't. The new house started out okay, but then that nagging feeling about being followed slowly crept back in. Not as intense, but noticeable. When we first moved in, we all shared a bedroom because there was a lot of unpacked boxes and stuff cluttering up the spare room. One of the things in the spare room was a bouncer for the baby. This was a Fisher-Price bouncer that had a frog on it, and if you rolled the frog's eyes, it would play music. One day around four in the morning, the frog started playing music. I looked over at the crib, thinking that my now toddler might have somehow gotten out and was playing with it but he was fast asleep. The next day, I wanted to figure out how it could have gone off by itself. I tried to get that thing to play again without spinning the eyes. I knocked it around and stomped on the floor next to it, but nothing happened. So I told myself the batteries must be malfunctioning, but this was the one and only time it ever happened, and we never had to change the batteries in the two years that we used it. I began to feel that something was watching me again, only now it was strongest in the conservatory out back. There was a set of double doors between the kitchen and the conservatory, and one night, my wife asked me to close them. I didn't ask her why, I just did it. A little while later, I went out back to have a cigarette. As I stepped outside, the glass doors of the conservatory were in front of me. All I could see in the reflection was the kitchen behind me. But then I saw in the reflection a black silhouette of a person running, and it ran into the house, through, 
the wall. At first I thought it was somebody outside, but then I realized that it couldn't have been anyone outside, as the figure was briefly obscured by my own reflection, so it had to have been somebody in the room behind me. I quickly went back into the house. At first I wasn't going to tell my wife and scare her, but I decided to tell her about it the next day. She then told me that she wanted those doors shut in the first place because that room in the conservatory was making her nervous the day before, more so than usual. We had another experience about a month later, which could have ended very badly. While driving down the road getting ready to pull onto the motorway, my wife suddenly hit the brakes. When I asked her what she was doing, she said that a dark shadow figure ran right in front of the car almost causing her to lose control. But there was no one around at all. That road is located by the woods, far away from any houses. I was in the back seat with our son, so I didn't see it. But my mother-in-law was in the front, and she saw it too. We eventually moved again. But just like in the last place, this house took a parting shot. On the day we moved out, as we were taking our belongings from the house to the van, a heavy roof tile slid down the side of the house, narrowly missing us. This all happened about eight years ago now, but we often still walk past that first house we lived in. It comes up for rent a lot since nobody ever stays there very long. But the funny thing is, every time we see it on the market again, we both have a very strong desire to move back in. We've even talked about going for a fake viewing, just so we can walk around the place. We never have, but even the idea that after everything that happened to us there, we still feel an urge to go back? Well, that's something my brain just can't explain. I'm tempted to go back through all the old census records to see if an Ernest ever lived in that house. But so far, I've resisted that temptation partly out of fear of setting something off again, and partly because I might not like the answer. When are skeptics going to learn to stop playing with things that they don't understand? Just because you don't believe in something does not mean that it doesn't exist. How many stories need to be told before people start realizing that? Have you ever lived in a haunted house? Let's have a conversation about it in the comments section below. And after that, you can click on the screen above and keep listening to more stories so that you can stay scared, my friends. <laughs>